Take your copy of God's Word and turn to the Gospel of Luke, the first chapter, Luke chapter 1. And then I want to encourage you to grab a pen, pencil, lipstick, mascara, Crayola, something you can write with, perhaps it's just your finger, and and then grab something you can write on because this is a very practical, simple time in God's Word where I think God may place on your heart some application that you want to put into practice. I remember the first time I left Florida in the winter after living here. I was living in southwest Florida. I was taking a flight back uh, up north, and I knew it was going to be cold, but I was caught off guard by another change. As as the plane began to land, I, I noticed everything outside of the windows was brown, It was so depressing. The grass was brown. The trees were brown. The clouds were gray. It was, I was missing the green grass and the green palm trees and the sunshine of Florida. This time of year, people all over the world hold on to the evergreen trees. Whether they are live trees, like in some of your homes, or artificial evergreens, like in our home, the evergreen is is kind of a symbol of Christmas. As we enter into the Christmas season as a church, I want us to use the idea of the evergreen to think about something else that's unchanging, and that is the unchanging character of the God that we worship, the unchanging nature of the one whose birth we celebrate. And we're going to zero in on some specific elements that are unchanging. And they're outlined for us in Romans chapter 15, verse 13. So let me read that verse before we go and hear from Dr. Luke. Romans 15, 13 says this, may the God of hope, say hope, fill you with all joy, say joy, and peace, say peace, As you trust him, say trust, Trust. so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. We're going to focus on these four things, the hope, the faith or the trust, the joy and the peace that are unchanging in Jesus Christ. Today, we're focusing on hope. Before we get into that, I want to take you to maybe a dark place, sorry, But can you think back to a time when you felt hopeless? Maybe you were in despair. Perhaps it was the death of a loved one or the loss of a marriage or utter failure in your life. And and you just couldn't quite figure out how to get out of that hole, how to go forward. As people sometimes say, you were at the end of the rope, or or you were done. But something happened, because you're here. Uh, Hopefully today, as we go through a story of one of the most familiar and most beloved individuals in all of history, hopefully you'll be reminded of something that happened. But perhaps... Perhaps you're in that state. You've come and and hope is at least somewhat lost. 
You're overwhelmed in this moment. Maybe it's your physical health. Maybe it's your marital condition. Maybe it's just the, the facts of the future are the uncertainty as a student of, of what it is that you're going to do with your life. And you wonder, how do I go forward? How do I find hope? And I believe there are answers in the story of Mary. This is Dr. Luke in Luke 1 and verse 26. This is the word of God. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel went to her and said, Greetings, you are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and, and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him, let's say that name together, Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. <laughs> How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin? And the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. Do you believe that last sentence, church? No word from God will ever fail. Let's pray together once more. So Father, in the name of Jesus, we have just read your word. So we know you're speaking to us. And we've read a specific promise in your word that your word will not fail. We, we think back of other promises that tell us your word will not return void or, or without impact. And so our prayer is simple, that you would continue to speak to us, that you would give us what we need that we don't have, that you would teach us what we've not yet learned but we need to know, and that you'd make us, shape us, change us into different men and women, boys and girls. People of all ages that reflect you, the hope of the world. And Lord, I pray that the words I say and even my thoughts would be pleasing to you. For you're my strength, you're my redeemer. Oh, and Jesus, as, as we talk about hope, would you save someone today who hears these words? Would you change someone for all eternity because they've listened to your message today? And we're going to say thank you in advance for doing that, even as I ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. This is an extremely simple and very practical message because all of us can relate to that need for hope right? We say that often as we gather together. You're going to need hope because either you're in a storm, you've just come out of a storm, or you don't have a clue, but you're headed into a storm. And in the storms of life, when the waves come and, and we feel tossed and turned, those are the moments we desperately need hope. So the question is, what do we do when hope is needed? In this passage of Scripture that we just read, you find, again, a very familiar story. This is kind of the beginning of what we would call the Christmas story. It's the origin story, if you will, of Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, born into a world that, guess what, needed hope. For 400 years, even the people of God, the children of Israel, they felt like God had been silent. They were waiting, looking for answers. 
needing someone, something to help them. Their civilization had been destroyed. They were just existing with a promise. A promise that a better day, another day, a new day is coming. And it's in that setting that an angel appears to a teenage girl. 15 to 16 years old. Mary was already engaged. Now I know we have some young ladies that age in this room. That's too young to be engaged today. She was already engaged to be married, but she was living a pure life. She was not living with the one she was engaged to be married to, nor had they consummated their relationship. And so she was just a part of this hopeless society. And yet in the interaction that she has with Gabriel the angel, I think we see what we do when hope is needed. So let me give you four things, very simple. First of all, when hope is needed, God sends a messenger. God sends a messenger. Don't you love angel stories? We're kind of intrigued by that. Years ago, there was a real popular show on TV called Touched by an Angel. Everybody just loved to watch what would happen when that angel shows up. But the reality is God's word says that angels are still at work. It says we live in a spiritual realm because in our, in our battle spiritually, we're battling not against flesh and blood, but we're battling against spiritual forces. This is an encounter with an angel, but the reality is all throughout the Old Testament, God sent messengers, sometimes angels, sometimes people to talk about his hope. Let me give you a few examples. In 2 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 12, it says, When your days are over, David, and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Just a message of hope. Or how about this one from Isaiah 7 and verse 14? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Isaiah the prophet, just a messenger of hope. He, in verse nine, in chapter 9 and verse 6, again, we have a message of hope from Isaiah. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, a message of hope. The prophet, the messenger of hope, Micah, in Micah chapter 5 and verse 2, but to you, Bethlehem, a pastor, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come from me one who will be ruler over all of Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times, a message of hope. God's messenger sometimes spoke in times of deep, deep despair. Jeremiah, the prophet, was talking to the children of Israel when they were captive in Babylon. They were going to be ruled by the Babylonians for 70 years. And yet God sent a messenger of hope who says, I know the plans for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. I want you to be aware, sometimes God's messengers of hopes are the people around us. Sometimes he still uses angels. Maybe you're like me and... I, I think there are times that um, angels have been a part of my life. And in fact, I, I've been struck for more than 30 years by something I heard my father-in-law say. Well, we were driving through Houston, Texas, and we passed a homeless person where I grew up in South Carolina. We had not seen that very much. And so I, I noticed that he stopped and and he gave that person something. And, and so a, a conversation ensued, and, and I remember him saying, you know, you never know when you're entertaining angels unaware. The Bible says this about angels in Psalms 91, 11, For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. Who are the messengers of hope in your life? In, in my life, I, I've been really blessed. I recognize that. I, I grew up in a godly home. So the first messengers of hope were my parents. My, my dad and my mom, they were constantly breathing hope into me. Um, and, and then I grew up in church. 
Because as godly parents, they knew that they should prioritize the things that would make a difference in my life. And, and so, man, I could just name people, people like Mr. Tommy Ganey and people like Mr. Kimsey Tollison. They were always old, as long as I can remember. They were old. But they were involved in speaking hope into my life. Miss Elizabeth Dean speaking hope as an older lady into my life. But then there were some younger folks too. Folks like Paula Stanley or, or, or people like Doug and Becky Winters. A young couple in their 30s who had a couple of kids. But they spent time with youth in our church. And they were just breathing hope into our lives. And then I went off to seminary and... Kimberly and I started dating and then got married. And Man, there was a couple. He, he used to be an athletic director at a university, and now he's a pastor at a church. His, his name was John West. John and Charlotte West, man, they breathed hope into our life. They were messengers of hope. And all throughout my life in ministry, God's given me people like that. And in Georgia, there are people like Jerry Kirkpatrick and, and Becky Black that just regularly spoke hope in, into my life. And in Florida, I think of a man named Jack Pip, who just regularly, I saw him again recently, and he just still spoke hope into my life. Out of Missouri, there were people like the DeGraffin Reeds and the Snyders who were just constantly breathing hope into my life. And, and then God God moved us here, and, and it, at risk of, of hurting someone's feelings, I hate to do that, but there are so many people that breathe hope. People like Robert Holt, who every morning, every Sunday morning, including this day, he, he sends me a text with, with several sentences just letting me know he's praying for me as I preach the word today, just breathing hope into my life. Friends like Greg Cronus, who, who, who even when I'm having a bad day, might just shoot me a text and say, hey, I'm thinking about this and let be encouraged by this. Or, oh, sweet Mary Shellnut, who is constantly just breathing hope into my life. Now, why would I give you all those names? Because when hope is needed, God sends messengers of hope. And it may be an angel like Gabriel, but it, it may be somebody that's sitting on the road near you. I want you to think about in your life. This is where you might want to write something down. Who have been some of the messengers of hope in your life? Who've been some of the people that, man, when you felt like, I don't know if I can continue, they've given you the courage to continue. They've, they've helped you keep fighting. They've let you know it's worth going forward. I would jot down their name right now. Here's why. Because if you're like me, you might forget again. And you probably need to text them or call them or write them a little note and just let them know what they mean to you. But here's another one. Who in your little corner of the world needs a messenger of hope? Maybe it's in your family or in your neighborhood or in your classroom. Who needs to know that there is hope? And you know, those of us who gather here in a place and a space like this, we sing and, and we smile and we read the Bible and we declare that we've got hope, but that's not to be kept to ourselves. We're supposed to share that. That's why in Peter, Peter tells us in 1 Peter 3, 15, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you the reason for the hope that you have. Who in your little corner world needs hope? Because here's what I know. When hope is needed, God will always send a messenger of hope. Now, to the children of Israel, he sent Gabriel to a teenage girl. So that's where we learn the second thing I want you to get today. When hope is needed, God has a message. What's the message? And maybe the message for that person in your little corner of the world is, is just a word of encouragement. You don't have to be a, a theologian or even a Sunday school teacher to encourage somebody. Everybody likes to be encouraged. That word just means to put courage into, and all of us need somebody to build into us. But the angel to Mary had a specific message. You know what the message was? There's actually several things. One of the things he said is, hey, hey Mary, God knows you. And can I just tell you, you need to be aware 
regardless of how alone you feel, regardless of, of what you're going through, regardless of where you've been, the creator of the universe knows you. He knows your name. He knows your needs. As a friend of mine said to me many, many years ago, Paul, God knows your address. He knows where to find you. You're not lost. But, but not just he knows you, he cares about you. That's what Gabriel told Mary. You are favored, but that's not just for married. The, the Bible tells us that we can cast our cares on God. Why? Because he cares for us. No matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, the God of the universe cares about you. That's a good message, isn't it? But not just that. He knows you. He, he cares about you. And, and he is with you. God is with you. Remember, that's what Mary was told that people are going to refer to her son as Emmanuel. God with us. But all of that was just a side message. Because the overarching message that the, the angel Gabriel gave to Mary was summed up in one name. The name that she was to call her son. Gabriel said, Mary, you're going to call him Jesus. Say that name with me. Jesus. You know what that means? Like a lot of names, that name has meaning. And, and it simply means the one who saves. So the message that God was sending is, is to the people of Israel, and it's still a message that applies to us today. And here's the message. God will save you. Jesus still saves. Isn't that good news? Jesus still saves. We celebrate that because we talk about what we call the gospel or the good news. And we've just been studying through Romans, and, and in Romans, you can have what some people call the Romans Road that really outlines that gospel, the good news. So here it is, just in case you've never heard it. In Romans 3.23, we have just the reality. It says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It just reminds us we're all in the same boat. We're not necessarily all bad people, but we are all sinners. We've all missed God's design. Romans 3.23. The next verse, Romans 6.23. You know what it says? The wages or the payment, the punishment for sin is, guess what? Death. The punishment for sin is death. And the Bible even teaches where that takes place. It's death in hell. But for, fortunately, the verse doesn't end there. It says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And the Bible tells us where that takes place, in heaven with Jesus. So how do I get that? That's the one I want, the gift. Well, Romans 5.8. Romans 5.8 says that God demonstrates his love in that while I was still a sinner, Christ died for me. So what I hear about Jesus dying on the cross, that death that he suffered, it was to take that punishment for my sin. He paid my wage, the wage that I deserve, the wage that you deserve because you're a sinner. That Jesus paid that wage. So how do I take advantage of that? I still want to know, how do I get this gift? That's Romans 10, 9, because it says, if I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead, I can be saved. And remember, that's the good news, right? Jesus means God will save. So who can experience that? This one's so good, I want you to see it on the screen. It's Romans 10, 13. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Let's say just that statement together, starting with everyone. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So a question, really, as we talk about when we need hope, God sends a message, he has a message. A question we need to ask today is, have you called on the name of the Lord? Has there been a time in your life where you called on the name of the Lord and we're saved. That's still the message today. So I've had you put on your thinking caps as 
my mom used to say, hey, you, you've got on your thinking cap, I want you to think back to when you were saved. Uh, most of us who gather here, um, you say you're already a Christian. You say you're saved, so think back to when that was. All right? You got it? This means yes. This means no. Are you thinking back to when I'm saved? If you got it, do this, okay? Aren't you thankful that God saved you? Do you remember what it was like before that? Now, if you're like me, I, I was saved as a child, so God spared me from a lot. But, but some of you, you were caught up in abuse or addiction or anger or fear or immorality. And yet God saved you. He, he filled that voice, that void. And so in the midst of your hopelessness, God gave you the message, Jesus saves. That's why we sing songs like, when I think about the Lord, how he saved me, how he, he picked me up and he turned me around and he, he places my feet on solid ground. It makes me want to shout. That's a good thing. Oh, when hope is needed, God sends a messenger. And when, when hope is needed, God has a message. But there's another thing here. When, when hope is needed, God performs miracles. Do you believe God still performs miracles, church? I believe he does. I, I really believe he does. And so Mary, this teenage girl, uh, first of all, she's already having an, an, an out-of-this-world day because she's having a conversation with an angel. And the angel says, you're going to have a baby. And so she says, time out. Houston, we have a problem. Um, I'm not great at math, but I know there's something missing in this equation. And, and so the Bible spells it out very clearly. She says, how can I have a baby? Because I, I, I'm engaged, but I don't have a husband in that way. And, and what does Gabriel do with her how question? I want you to think about that because all of us have how questions. Part of our hopelessness is because we don't know how God is going to get us out of this. We don't know how we're going to make it through another day. We don't, we don't know how we're going to go forward. So what does the angel do with Mary's how question? He turns her to God. He says, the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you. You, you. you see, the secret answer to your how questions is to always go back to God. Between services, I, I went to my office for a couple of minutes and I, I pulled up the Brooklyn Tabernacle because I just wanted to hear what my pastor was preaching and they were already at the invitation and my friend Michael O'Brien was singing and playing behind him there and it just made me think about Pastor Jim Simbla and and some of the things he's taught me. And just one of those things that I've tried to share with you. And I don't think you can hear it too much. That when, when you don't know what else to do. Sometimes all you can do is pray. And, and sometimes when you don't know what to pray. Sometimes all you can say is what? Jesus. Jesus. Sometimes all I, I, I know to do is just say Jesus. And so sometimes the answer to my how question is just to look. To God and say, Jesus, let me ask you today, you, you said you believe that God still does miracles. Are you trusting God for miracles in your life? Are you trusting God for marriage miracles, for financial miracles, for healing miracles, for provisional miracles in your life? Oh, you can trust him, church. When hope is needed, God sends a messenger. When, when hope is needed, God has a message. When, when hope is needed, God performs miracles. That's what Gabriel said. Mary, God's got this. He's going to take care of this. You just be faithful. And that leads us to the last thing. When hope is needed, God gives you a moment. I, I want you to say this with me. Say, this is the moment. It is, it is. This is the moment. Because after the appearance of the messenger, the deliverance of the message, and the promise of a miracle, Mary had a moment. It's a moment we all get every time we come in contact with God, whether in a quiet time, whether reading the Bible or in prayer, or whether on a, a time of corporate worship like this. We get to decide what are we going to do with what God has said to us. 
right? That's the moment. That's what Mary had to do. She had to make a decision that would determine her destiny. And so she decided. If we continue reading, you see what she says. In verse 38, she says, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. She submitted to God. That's what it means to to trust the Lord. That's what it means to live in hope, to say, God, I don't have to understand this. I don't necessarily have to like this. But I'm going to put all my hope in you, Jesus. That's what my friend Karen had to do after experiencing something no one wants to experience. Listen to her story. My boyfriend and I um, cooked a dinner and we left to go to Bible study at 6.45. We were all praying like how we normally do on Monday nights. And I remember getting a phone call from my neighbor saying, you got to come home. You got to come home right away. You have to come home. Where are you? Where's the dog? And I said, Ben, something's wrong. We have to go. I remember going to my apartment and I couldn't I couldn't drive just because of I didn't know what to expect to saying to come home right away. I then saw all the fire trucks, the firefighters rushing in to my apartment. And that's when my heart sunk and I dropped to the floor. I didn't know what lied ahead of me. I didn't have any hope. I didn't want to listen to my Christian um, worship music in the mornings. I didn't really want to read the Bible. I remember I was pushing myself away. It wasn't until Wednesday night when I decided to go to the house of prayer. And I usually don't go to the house of prayer, but I, fe- I felt like I just needed to go. I couldn't be in the moment when they were praying for the church um, and they were praying for others. I just, I had to go to the altar and just kneel and just cry it out. And I was emotional, upset, and I couldn't stop crying. I then felt a hug and it was Kimberly Purvis. And I am just so grateful for her. And I will never forget this throughout my life, what that prayer and praying over me, because it was then with Pastor Paul and Kimberly Purvis praying over the congregation for me that I felt just a little bit of hope. So God really used his people by just coming beside me. I remember it feeling like I had a whole army of people just supporting me, praying for me. I remember all of the pastors calling me and Pastor Paul called me that night and we were at Target and I remember him saying, whatever you're doing, stop. We are gonna pray right now. And here we were, me, Ben and Amy, and Pastor Paul on the phone praying in the middle of Target. And that's when I knew that God's people and God really had me and he was not gonna let me go. And I know God was orchestrating all of that. I know that God provided me with hope that it was going to be okay. Isn't that an awesome story? I I want you to think about what you heard Karen say in this hopeless situation. God sent her messengers of hope. She heard a message of hope. God showed her miracles of hope. And by the way, more miracles are happening because Ben and Karen are getting married here soon. Isn't that great? But it wasn't realized until there was a moment of hope where you have to decide, am I going to trust that God's got me? 
that, that he can handle this, that he really is with me. So the same thing that that teenage girl Mary had to decide, you guys, you, you've got to deal with. We have to deal with on a daily basis in those moments of hopelessness, we have to decide, am I going to live in this moment? And throughout Scripture, there's all kinds of examples of those who've done that. Folks like Nicodemus in John chapter 3, he, he, he basically went to Jesus and said, I want some of that hope stuff you got. How do I get into your kingdom, into your club? And, and Jesus said, you got to be born again. There's got to be a moment. And he said, I've, I don't know if I can be born again. And he said, no, you got to be born again. There's got to be a moment. And the third time, that's when we get this great verse, for God so loved the world, Nicodemus said, that he gave his only son, that whosoever believes in him shall have everlasting life or hope that lasts forever. Don't perish, but there's got to be a moment. So what can we learn from Mary's moment? I thought you'd never ask. Let me tell you, and then we're done. How did Mary respond? First of all, Mary responded gradually. And this will be encouraging for some of you because some of you, you're making the foolish mistake that you believe everybody's face, Facebook and Instagram f- post. You, th- you think life is as good as they say it is and pretend it is. And, and so when you come into a, a corporate setting of worship like this, you think that everybody's further along than you and everybody's doing better than you and everybody's got more faith than you. And if you're not careful, you get hopeless and you give up because you, you don't realize it's okay to be on the journey. And I just want you to understand that even in this story... It, took time for Mary to process this and get to the place of total trust. It was gradual. Uh, Her response was gradually. But secondly, it was thoughtfully. (laughs) She thought through this. She was thinking, wait a second, this can't be. And, And that's where some of you are with whatever it is that's going on in your life. You're thinking, I don't think this can work out. I don't see any hope. And that's all right. When you trusted God, you did so in faith, but he didn't ask you to check your brain at the church door. You've got these things that you're thinking through. That's all right. Use that brain and still trust him in faith. And she responded gradually. She responded thoughtfully, but then she responded obediently. She said, okay. See, that, that's where I want to ask if you are today. Are you willing to say, oh, okay, God, I, I really will trust you in this. I, I'll put my hope in you. Because all the rest of the New Testament, that's what it tells us, that we follow him in obedience because of the hope that we have in him. Listen to 1 Timothy chapter 4. This is why we labor and strive, because we put our hope in the living God, the Savior of all people, and especially those who believe. So why do we do all this stuff we do? It's because of our hope. Our, our Titus chapter 2 verse 11, for the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So these things we do, our obedience, our hope should fuel obedience in our life. That should be our response. So we respond gradually sometimes. We respond thoughtfully. We respond obediently. And then the last thing, she responded worshipfully. If you continue this story in Luke 1, you'll eventually get down to verse 46. And this is what it says. And Mary said, I think think it probably should say, and Mary sang My soul glorifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. You see, when you put your hope in God, you'll want to come worship him even when you don't have it all figured out, even when you don't know all the answers, even when you may not see how this is going to end up, you're going to say, how great thou art. You're going to sing, my victory is in Jesus. You're going to sing, tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. You're going to want to worship him because that's who you are. Now, why is that so important? 
It's so important because that's how this is all going to end up. We're at kind of a, a sweet stage of life. As of yesterday, we now have moved both of Kimberly's parents here to our area. Um, and most of you know, for about two and a half years, my mom has lived here. And so, of course, it's the holidays. Mom and I have had a, a few sweet moments, uh, even in the last couple of days. And a couple of days ago, I was taking her back to her apartment, and I was about to leave, and I was hugging her, and my sweet mama looked at me, and she said, can you believe I'm about to be, I'm almost 90 years old. She's still got a few years, but she said, I'm almost 90 years old. And I said, I know, Mom. But I, I said, let me just tell you, I, I would pray that if I get to be about 90 years old, that I'd be as, as uh, sharp and as strong and, and as good as you are. And she didn't miss a beat. She said, oh, you're not going to get to be 90 years old. And I'm like, time out. This doesn't seem fair. What, what's going on here? And she said, because I believe that Jesus is going to come back while I'm still alive. And I said, I, I know, Mom, you've been telling me that all of my life. And she has. But we've lost some of that in the church. This belief that Jesus is coming again. This understanding that our hope that began at the birth of Christ continues and breathes into us because this same Jesus who came as an infant is coming as King. That's who he is. That's what we've got to look forward to. That's what Paul's talking about in this passage of Scripture. So just listen. And if this moves you, you might just cheer it on. This is the Word of God. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who've fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left into the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who've fallen asleep, for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And after that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and we'll be together with the Lord forever therefore encourage one another with these words brothers and sisters when we need hope God will send us a messenger even a middle aged preacher from South Carolina and when we need hope God will give us the message and the message is Jesus still saves. And when we need hope, God will perform miracles. He's still doing that today. And when we need hope, he'll give us a moment. And we get to choose how we're going to respond. So what's your choice? Let's bow our heads. So that's the simple question. Am I going to live with hope? Will I truly live as if all my hope is in Jesus? I want to first talk to those of you who would say, Pastor Paul, there's no doubt in my mind I'm going to spend forever in heaven with Jesus. I know I'm a Christian. What has God said to you today that you need to respond to? Maybe it's just looking up to Him and living as if you believe that He's coming again. But maybe it's very practical. Maybe He's asking you to be a messenger of hope. And even right now, He's putting somebody on your mind. And as you think through the next month, heading into the celebration of the birth of Christ. He wants you to take a specific interest in being a messenger of hope to a specific person. Maybe he's just saying, I need you to trust me for the miracles I'll do in your life. 
Maybe you need some of those miracles we talked about, but you're not really trusting God. One thing I see in Scripture, the miracles that Jesus performed were always respond, were always in response to faith in the life of those who needed them. Whatever your need. But some of you are here and you've never begun a relationship with Jesus Christ. Why not today? Why not respond to him and place your trust, your hope in Jesus? Why not follow him? Why not yield control like Mary did and just say, all right, I submit. Let's do it your way, Lord. If that's something you want to do, you don't actually need a pastor or a priest to do that. Jesus made it possible for you just to talk straight to God. And you can just tell him, God, I know I'm messed up. I'm a sinner. I believe you paid for my sin. You, you paid the price. You, you died on the cross for me. And, and I want you to take control of my life. You can do it as simply as that. But sometimes it helps us just to have somebody else walk us through it. And so if that's you, maybe you'd pray these words as your prayer to God. Just you and him. Maybe you'd say this, dear Jesus. Just you and him. Dear Jesus. I know I need you. Just tell him, I need you, Lord. I'm a sinner. I need to be saved. I understand my life is hopeless without you. Did you get that? I understand my life is hopeless without you. But I believe that you died. I believe you died so I can have hope and forgiveness and life. So here I am. Like Mary, I still have some questions. But I'm going to trust you with everything I've got. I'm going to follow you from this day forward. I want you to come into my life. But I want you to take control of my life. And then tell him this. Say, Jesus, all my hope is in you. Tell him thank you if you just prayed that prayer. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, but if you're here in this room, I, I want to ask you a question. If you're watching on online and you just prayed that prayer with me, I, I wish you would just maybe in the comment section just tell someone you prayed that prayer. But if you're in this room and you just prayed that prayer with me, would you just slip your hand up right where you are? I'm not going to come into you and embarrass you or draw attention to you. But if you just prayed that prayer, that's awesome. Welcome to God's family. Young ladies back there, welcome to God's family. Others of you. Say you prayed that prayer with me today, beginning that relationship with Jesus, putting your hope in Him. If you did that, that's the most important thing you could ever do. And if you did that today, here's what I'm going to invite you to do. When I finish my prayer, we're going to begin to sing. There'll be pastors from this church that are standing at the front of this room, either side of where I am, one to my left and one to my right. I, I want you to go and tell one of those pastors, hey, I just prayed that prayer. What do I do next? It's not joining the church. You can't do that right here, but we'll make sure you've got a Bible, a copy of God's Word. Make sure you understand what you've done. But some of you also, you've got some things that have left you hopeless. And maybe the message from God's Word or even Karen's testimony encouraged you today. And you might just want to come and kneel here and pray, or you might want to come and take the hand of one of the pastors and just say, would you just pray with me that I continually put my hope in Jesus? I've trusted him for my salvation, but I'm not trusting him day in and day out like I need to. Whatever your need, we're going to sing, and you have an opportunity to come. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask that you move in this place for your glory, by your will. May your spirit guide us, not the clock or whatever we've got on our agenda. May you give us freedom, and we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand? Andrew's leading us. Whatever your need, just step out and come. I've been held by the sea.